Good morning, church. I will be reading from Isaiah, but I just want to say we had four youth sign up, and that was so much more than four. And I just praise God that he is working in their lives, and they are able to stand up here and glorify God in front of you guys. Um, so I will be reading from Isaiah 11, 1 through 11, and that is found on 1076 and 1077 in your pew Bibles. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from the roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decision for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. <clears throat> Pardon me. The wolf will lie with the lamb, and the leper will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox, the infant will play near the hole of a cobra, and the young child will put his hands hand into the viper's nest. Uh, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be inglorious. In the day of the Lord, we will reach out a hand a second time to reclaim the rem remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamlet, and from the islands of the sea. So says the Lord. <laughs> Some people have longer passages than others to read. <laughs> For many of us, the Christmas story is among the favorite portions of scripture that we have. After hearing it so many times, we have it mostly memorized. But actually, by focusing our attention on these little portions of scripture, we can miss the significance of the entire Christmas message, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the central theme of all the Bible. Christian songwriter and author Michael Card puts it this way, we have sentimentalized the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. When we think of the birth, we see wise men and shepherds and a star. But these are only minor characters in an exceedingly greater drama, the incarnation. The birth of the Christ is so much more than a birthday to be observed once a year. Our focus must become the incarnation, which we celebrate every minute of our lives. We must realize that the cry we hear drifting from the stable is the voice of the one who spoke the universe into being. Oh, the staggering realization that the little one, wrapped in rags, looking up at us from the trough, is in reality everything his special name reveals, God with us. The Old Testament is every bit as much of the Christmas story as the New Testament, and that is why we have been focusing on the Old Testament throughout this month. But I'd like to concentrate today on this passage that Felicia read for us and from Isaiah 11 that proclaims the coming of the Lord. The fact of Emmanuel, God with us. Now, to put this passage into its context, Isaiah in chapter 10 had described the downfall of the powerful Assyrian army in terms of a mighty forest consisting of flourishing trees growing thickly together and very tall, and of that forest being cut down and laid level to the ground. And so we read, first of all, in verse 18. The splendor of his forests and fertile fields it will completely destroy, as when a sick man wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forest will be so few that a child could write them down. And then continuing with this theme in verse 33, it says, See, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. 
The lofty trees will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. And then in chapter 11, Isaiah takes this image of a forest being chopped down to the ground, and he relates it to a spiritual and an eternal truth. He talks about the deliverance that is promised to God's people from that Assyrian army. But even more importantly, and even more far-reaching than that, he talks about the primary prophecy, which is the deliverance from sin by the Messiah that is promised and offered to all of God's people. And again, using the analogy of a tree, he talks about the shoot from the stump of Jesse. I learned this as the rod from the stem of Jesse from the King James, but the NIV really carries the meaning of the passage in words that we can better understand today to help us to make the connection with this analogy of a tree. Now, we all know what a stump is, right? You know, you've got trees cut down in your yard, and what's left is, is the stump. We can picture that in our minds of, of trees being cut down and, and nothing left but the stumps. Uh, what used to be a tree is now just the stump, and that is what is meant to be understood here. The Messiah is from the stump of Jesse. Now, Jesse, as most of you know, was the father of King David. And everybody knew that it was predicted that there would one day be someone who was descended from David who would be the promised Jewish Messiah. There are numerous Old Testament prophecies clearly indicating this. And how appropriate that would seem to be to have the promised future king coming from the kingly line of the throne of Israel and particularly identifying David who was the most powerful king that Israel had ever known. And so if this new king could establish the kind of kingdom that, that David had when he was king, then that would be a tremendous thing. Because by the time Isaiah wrote these words, what had been a great kingdom was next to nothing. It too was like a forest laid bare. Yes, they were promised that Assyria would be taken care of and they wouldn't have to worry about them. But if you know your history, Babylon was just around the corner, and God's people were certainly in need of a deliverer and a savior. And then at the time that Christ was born, there certainly wasn't much of a kingdom there either. The people were oppressed by the Romans, and they were in desperate need for someone to come along and to rescue them and to restore them to their previous greatness. So that the time for deliverance was ripe. The Messiah had come. See, Jesus is that stump uh, that, that shoot that comes from the stump. He was a descendant of David. In fact, every single prophecy about the Messiah is fulfilled in Jesus, or, or it will be. But at the time that Christ was born, being a descendant of David wasn't all that big of a deal. It didn't mean nearly as much as the people in the Old Testament times would have thought. Yes, the, the line was still intact. We see that from genealogies of, of, of Jesus, that he descended from the line of David. But there really wasn't any prestige or importance placed on it. All that was left was just a remnant, a memory, really, of what used to be something great. Do you know that is all that God has ever needed to accomplish his purposes? Just a remnant of his followers. But what had once been a great regime, a great and strong tree, was now reduced to an old stump, cut down, decaying, topped off at the root. But here the image is vivid. Verse 1 of our passage in Isaiah 11 says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Out of that old stump comes forth a shoot, a rod, a branch, a tender twig, just shooting out, appearing weak and fragile, but which would prove to prosper and be fruitful. And I think it's significant that the stump is connected to Jesse and not David. Jesse wasn't anyone famous or, or royal or powerful. His son David would be, but, but not Jesse. But from that stump would come the shoot. Out of decay and death comes a symbol of life. What was given up for lost and, and gone has been revived. So this image to me has Christmas written all over it. The baby Jesus is that tender, frail twig who was from the family of David, which had at that time sunk into such total obscurity that it was a humiliation. And Jesus humbled himself, took the form of a servant, born in a smelly cow barn to a poor family from the stump of what had once been the great tree of David, but now just a distant remnant of an obscure person named Jesse. But from that humiliation comes glory and victory. 
from the grave, from the stump, from the remnant, from the leftovers, God bestows life and gives victory. Something important for us to remember, when things seem bleakest, without hope, God is with us and he promises to restore his kingdom. And when Jesus comes back, it won't be as a twig, but as a mighty forest, more powerful than any army. But first, he came as a tiny child, in humiliation from the stump of an old tree. And Jesus would spend his entire lifetime that way, reflecting the paradox that is his incarnation. An ancient writing from Pope Gregory in 381 AD puts it this way, He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, yet he wipes away our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. The rest of this passage from Isaiah 11 completes the Christmas story. It tells why the Messiah came, what he did and what he will do, and how he accomplishes his purposes. First of all, we see that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. This is a condition that is absolutely necessary for any important and effective ministry of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is a part of every great thing that God has ever done, starting with creation. We're told the Holy Spirit was there then. Moving on to every miracle you can think of of being recorded, it was the work of the Holy Spirit that those things are possible. When we talk about our being born again, our rebirth, we were born of the Spirit, we're told. We talk about the influence of God's chosen leaders, that those were works of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God. It is the presence of God in the world today. And ever since Pentecost, it is the presence of God in the lives of of us believers. Now, until that time, the Bible says that the Spirit rested upon certain people at certain times. People like Samuel or, or David or Elijah or Elisha. They were given the power of the Holy Spirit. And that power was dependent upon their obedience to God. And, and it could be taken away from them at the Lord's discretion. You might remember that after David sinned, that he prayed desperately for God not to take the Holy Spirit away from him. Well, Jesus, being the Son of God, being totally obedient to the will of the Father, had the total resources of God the Spirit at his disposal. As verse 2 tells us, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. We see from this passage that Jesus had the resources of three different kinds. First of all, we see an intellectual life that was indicated by wisdom and understanding of the Spirit. Second, we see the resource of practical ability as indicated by his counsel and power. And third, we see the resource of spirituality or spiritual life identified by his knowledge and fear of the Lord. Now, these resources are made available to us too. And even though they are a gift to believers indwelled by the Spirit, we don't receive these gifts as as presents to be unwrapped and taken possession of like we do our Christmas gifts, but rather these gifts come in time and under obedience to the Lord's will. But they are valuable resources used for our service to the Lord, just as they were for Jesus. So first of all, an intellectual life is important to believers. Now, this aspect is often minimized by Christians saying, oh, you don't have to have a lot of knowledge, just just believe. Or sometimes it's ridiculed by non-Christians. All those Christians are so stupid, they believe in miracles, even they don't know anything about science and think these things aren't possible. But either way, the intellectual life is something that just can't be ignored. God expects us to use our minds. Some of us may be more limited in that area than others, but each one of us can receive from the Spirit wisdom and understanding when we learn from life's experiences, and when we learn to apply scriptures to our lives. God cannot use us fully unless we submit all of our life to him, including our minds and our intellect. But we also need practical ability, that spirit of counsel and power to be able to implement the things that we've learned. Now, you may know people who are very intelligent, but they don't have a lick of common sense. This aspect of life cannot be ignored to to use practical ability, the things that you know and learn. 
And that comes from God's spirit. It comes from living and learning and, and loving and being involved with life and with people. And then the spiritual life is the essence of life itself. And it involves a fear of the Lord, a reverence and respect for God's commandments and his authority. The spiritual life cannot be separated from knowledge. And not necessarily the kind of knowledge that you memorize and recite, but, but the knowledge that comes from seeking and finding the Lord. A knowledge that comes with dedication and commitment to him. You don't have to be smart to be knowledgeable or to have a spiritual life. But it also doesn't come cheaply. It comes from knowing the Lord and taking up his cross. Now, notice that the resources with which Jesus was equipped were suited to the task that he was given to do. Let's look at verse 3. It says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Intellectually, practically, spiritually, Jesus was the one appointed to carry out this prophecy to delight in the fear of the Lord. And he would do so by judging the needy with righteousness, requiring that the proper intellect to be able to judge. He would do so by giving decisions for the poor of the earth, requiring the practical ability to do just that. And he would do so by striking the wicked earth with judgment, requiring the spiritual authority to do so. This requires all of the spiritual resources that were mentioned. And this is what Jesus came to do. And that is what he's coming again to do. And that's why we need to understand that Christmas is about so much more than just a baby in a manger. It is the triune God manifesting himself to the world. Notice also the context of the ministry of the Messiah. It is directed toward concepts that we might usually tend to view as being negative. You know, the fear of the Lord, the poor, the needy, the wicked. You know, these are the focus of his attention. Now, sometimes in churches, we might have the notion that if we could just bring in the most prestigious people, the wealthy, the popular, the talented, then we could have a much better chance of being successful. Of course, we're not going to ignore the rest of the people, but if we could just make the prestigious people our primary targets, then surely their influence and their resources would really help the church. But Jesus' ministry was just the opposite. It was directed to what we might sometimes call the lowlifes of society. And I am convinced that unless the church of the day also directs their ministry to the poor and to the sick and to the outcast, that there's really no way that we can expect the spirit of the Lord to rest upon the church. As Jesus himself said in Matthew 9, 12, it's, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. He's not come to call the righteous or those who think that they're righteous, but rather he's come to call sinners to repentance. And if the church of the day is able and willing to direct our emphasis on people around us who are spiritually sick, and who need the Lord, then we will be the church that Christ came to establish. And so that means welfare families, homeless people, people who struggle with mental illness, people who have a criminal history, those with little or no income. And yes, such a ministry creates problems for a church that it wouldn't have otherwise. The worship services tend to be a little different. Financial burdens are greater. There are extra responsibilities on the mature Christians in the church. But a ministry without problems is not a ministry at all. It's just a club. And that's not what Jesus came for. That's not why a baby was born in a manger, to start a club. That's not why a twig grew from a stump. That's not why life was brought from death. And one more message to this passage and one more message to Christmas is that Jesus isn't finished. He has some long-range goals that will be completed when he comes again. There will be a restoration of nature. A beautiful description of that restoration is given in verses 6 through 10. It says, The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. 
it's kind of hard for us to imagine this the, the, the restoration of nature to a degree that that the wolf will live with the lamb and and an infant can play with a cobra that is so far from the reality of things as we know them but that is just purely symbolic of the kind of change that that's going to happen the kind of change that is needed in the world today despite the humanistic mentality that things are getting better and man is getting smarter and society is becoming more advanced, the fact remains that man is corrupt through and through and that corruption spreads to his environment and everything that he touches and it has to change for God to restore his kingdom. George Sweeting once estimated that for every prophecy predicting the first coming of Christ, there are eight predicting his second coming. And here we have some of both in Isaiah's prophecy. It's only when Jesus returns again to restore his order that the wolf will lie with the lamb and the leopard with the goat. It's only when he returns again that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord and that nations will turn to this root of Jesse, this child that shall lead them. It's only when he returns again that the saying will come to pass that even though he was humbled and made as a servant and was obedient to the point of death on a cross, that the name of Jesus will be exalted and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This, too, is the message of Christmas. If you want to share in his glory, you must share in his humiliation. And it is a humbling thing to admit that you're a sinner and that you need the Lord. But until you come to that point, you cannot be a part of his kingdom. You can never really know what Christmas means. As we look around people, we can see we're down to the stump. Society is so corrupt and man is so depraved that it really does seem hopeless sometimes. Let us remember the promise from of old that out of the stump would come a shoot. A branch would arise and bring hope to the world. Our only hope is through that branch, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has come to make all things new. Your life can be made new through your faith in him if you've not already made the decision to receive the salvation that he wants to give to you. If you would like to partake in the life of the Spirit of God made available to you through our Lord Jesus, you can do that today.